Hello, I would like to welcome everyone to our fourth Digital Fridays. Today we will be discussing making meaning with digital tools, practical and inclusive teaching strategies. We have the chat function available so you can ask questions or make comments and Rachel or Julie will address those questions or comments at the end or perhaps even throughout, I'll let them decide. And I just want to start by reading a quick uh, bio for Rachel and Julie. So Rachel is a PhD student at Old Dominion University studying rhetoric and the intersection of culture and technology. She is also an instructor for the Westover Honors College at the University of Lynchburg. Willis's research interests vary widely, ranging from pedagogy, masculinities and violence, cultural constructions of rhetoric, and the digital humanities. She likes beach volleyball <laughs> and is currently spending too much time dissecting Game of Thrones last season. <laughs> Very cute bio. Uh, Julie is a PhD student in literary and cultural studies and technology and media studies at Old Dominion University and a college instructor of literature and writing at James Madison University. Her current research focuses on the role of women in 19th and early 20th century Britain, especially as narrated in women to women periodicals and domestic advice literature of the time. She's also interested in digital humanities, especially feminist digital humanities, building and designing interactive digital editions, and ways to improve online reader experience across different platforms. She loves to spend time in archives, both dusty and digital. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Julie and Rachel. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate the chance just to uh, share this with uh, everyone. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to share my my slides that I have. Let's see. Oops, I'm not sharing yet, am I? Not yet. Okay. It's coming. <laughs> uh, today we are going to talk about practical and inclusive teaching strategies, how to make meaning with digital tools. Uh, one thing that Julie and I have discussed quite a bit this semester is uh, that sort of the failings that papers have in terms of the way we use them, what we think we're doing, when we're using them to assess student learning. And, uh, and so we thought that this made a lot of sense to present on this as uh, just a way to deconstruct and decolonize how papers are being used and uh, to provide some alternatives that are both practical and inclusive. Uh, so today we wanted to start by sort of laying out our rationale. Uh, when we discuss inclusivity, what we really mean is um, being welcoming of all students. And uh, this is something that we argue a paper can't always be. Uh, and part of this is because it's inherited, we've inherited papers from this long tradition of Western education, which is rooted in colonialism and imperialist ideology, white supremacy. And so when we are um, using papers as assessments, we think we're assessing student learning, uh, but really we're also assessing a number of other skills uh, that are not always inclusive. We might be assessing students' time management. Uh, if you've graded papers recently, you might be familiar with, you know, I am pretty sure this student wrote this between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m. Uh, after downing a couple cans of Red Bull. And um, so that's not always a great way to determine students' learning. We also might be assessing, you know, language and literary skills, literacy skills, I should say, um, that we don't share. Uh, students from different racial and ethnic backgrounds um, might actually be struggling with the language aspect of it, the communication, the written communication part of a, of a paper, as opposed to the actual demonstrating of their learning. So um, papers are not always inclusive in that regards either. So our argument here is that we can use digital tools to intervene and to offer students alternative ways of expressing their learning and their ways of knowing. Um, so we are positing this uh, as a strategy for maybe even decolonizing some of the Western ways of knowing, these Western regimes of knowledge. Uh, and we also think that when students are writing papers or doing even smaller writing to learn assignments, 
they think they're in conversation with just the instructor. And we think that digital tools can broaden that and invite a broader conversation for the student, uh, especially when you know, the digital tools are things that they engage with regularly. Uh, so I'm seeing a couple of questions. Is there anything that uh, we should address before I move on, Julie? No, okay. Uh, so we also wanted to talk about how so uh, first, we'll discuss a couple of ways of thinking about inclusivity before we move on to specific and practical examples, uh, different digital tools that you might be able to use. Uh, so when Julie and I were talking, we realized that inclusivity starts with us and it starts with ways that we think about our students and ways that we are interacting with them. And so at uh, at the very beginning of term or as you're preparing for term, we hope that you can utilize some of these ideas. Um, the syllabus is uh, for most of us instructors, this is our, it functions sort of like a contract with our students or if not a contract that's set in stone, a map, right? A map to the course and a map to who we are and what our expectations are of them. And that's often a digital tool. If you're like me, you might upload it into your learning management system, but then I also have it linked to, to in my Google Docs so that any change I do in the semester in Google Docs is automatically changed when the students access it. Um, so it's sort of a, um, a map for my course that is fluid in some way. And so that's one tool that you can use right off the bat thinking in terms of um, just the standard terms that you might use in, course, in courses. There was something going around earlier this semester about students might not know what office hours are. So it, it's great if instructors can explain an office hour is when you can expect me to be there. Um, we are aware of um, obstacles that students feel like they face sometimes um, that stand in the way of us and them. And we think that sometimes terms that they just might not be familiar with uh, are a part of those obstacles. So if I can explain to students at the beginning of the semester, hey, my office hours are from here to here. This means you don't need to email me for an appointment. You can come whenever you need to. And I want you to come. You're welcome to come. I expect you to come. That's really useful. Um, and something that I do actually is um, I make them turn in their first assignment, which is due the first week, uh, to me in my office during office hours, because I think that's another way that we can remove obstacles of time and distance and space if they know where I am uh, and if they know how to identify when I'll be available, uh, then right off the bat, I've established some good relationship there. Uh, another thing that I think is important is when we talk about student resources, we should be phrasing them, phrasing those things as assets for students and using empowering language rather than uh, considering students and sort of codifying students as people who need help, people who need our aid. Uh, when we talk about different things that um, they can utilize in the course or in the you know, university in general, we want students to be empowered because if they, if they're thinking in those positive terms, they're more likely to be confident in using those things. Um, if they're being sort of coded as people in need of aid, uh, people who um, are maybe not as expected to succeed like others, uh, then they might find that as an obstacle or they might not find that and experience that as welcoming. Uh, so that's something that we think just considering how we talk about things is important. Uh, another thing that we can do just as an easy thing is including our own preferred pronouns. You can do this, you know, in your email signature. You can do this when you introduce your course first day of class, that sort of thing. You might consider a land or territory acknowledgement in your syllabus, uh, which I think is sort of acknowledging this wider experience that we all have as education inherited from a colonial imperialist regime, but then also the fact that the space, the very space that we're on is colonized and taken from others um, is important to acknowledge. And then um, 
we also think it's important to build in time for explaining things really from the ground up. Uh, new technology that you might be using, old technology that you might expect students to have, you know, completely mastered, but they might not. Um, I've been noticing more and more students are comfortable using Google Docs than they are Microsoft Word, which is what I grew up using. And uh, so, so being able to explain the differences and knowing the differences is helpful, um, but also not asking students, hey, if you don't know how to do this, let me know and I'll cover that. Because again, students with less confidence, uh, students who don't feel like they belong in the academy, they might not be willing to out themselves. Um, and that's something that I actually was reminded of again this semester when um, I was like, you know, you guys have access to Microsoft Word. Uh, you should all have downloaded it already. You know, I was talking to juniors at that point. Um, so they've been here for three years, they should know. Uh, but if you don't know, we can do it real fast and nobody raised their hand. Okay, everybody knows, we'll move on. And it was, um, a student came up to me after class and said, you know, I'd really like you to show me how to do that if you can. And it was an eye-opening moment for me because I realized what I'd been doing. I realized that I'd been asking students to out themselves for a lack of knowledge. And I was really grateful that the student was willing to actually stop and, and talk to me after class because um, you know, maybe a year ago or two years ago, he wouldn't have. Uh, so that's really important that we build in time for explaining things from the ground up. Don't assume anything uh, because oftentimes some students know, but there are plenty who don't. Uh, and then I, I think we're going to move on to discussing some digital tools as practical and inclusive examples. Is there anything else I should talk about, Julie? You're muted. Sorry, we can move into the next part anytime. Okay. okay. Uh, so we've got some example assignments for you guys. This is going to be, I, I think, the more specific way of inclusivity and welcoming. Uh, and this is a great example assignment because I think it bridges the gap between building in time for students and uh, thinking inclusivity wise for students from the beginning. Uh, and then here's an example of how we can do that practically. So uh, a resource scavenger hunt, I like to do this my first day of class instead of just covering the syllabus because that's really boring. Um, with my older students, this will be just things, places that they'll need to go to for the course itself. So that might be the library, the writing center because I teach um, English. Uh, it might be you know, the media communications lab, uh, and then for my first years, I teach uh, freshman composition. I want them uh, to have experience physically interacting with much more than just the things they'll need for my course, because I need them to be successful um, in a lot of other ways too, right? They need to be successful mentally and emotionally. They need to be healthy. So I have them locate um, my office, the writing center, the library, you know, those tools that they'll need for my course, as well as the counseling center, uh, where is the gym? Where is uh, the financial services office? And I can do this the first day because I work at a small liberal arts university. Um, for those of you who are at bigger state universities where maybe they have to cross a highway to do this, uh, you might consider doing this as a, an assignment for the first week where they pair up or get in a group of three and this is something they do together outside of class time where they go to all of these different places and then submit proof through their selfies or some other way uh, that you want them to do that. Uh, and then Julie has some additional examples, so take it away. Sure. <clears throat> Hi. Um, thanks to Rachel for getting us started. We wanted to kind of um, be as smooth as possible here. So if, you, if she can move to the next slide since we're looking at her thing. Uh, one tool that I have used in um, professional writing courses that I do, and also um, anytime I'm working with students who are heading out into the career world and thinking about job hunting is um, a video. Uh, it's sort of an interview. It does a mock interview. And it's really um, a painful example in some ways because it does, it gives students a question and then it records them much like our current setup for this webinar. Um, and it 
it, they don't see themselves while it's recording them, but it records their answer. Then it goes to it with a black screen and then it gives them another question and does the same thing. And then at the end, they are able to review how they responded to those questions in a sort of extemporaneous on the spot kind of way. Um, and they are able to um, kind of critique themselves, but also to submit those videos um, to me if that's part of what our course is covering, um, job interview skills. Most of the time, just them watching it themselves, they'll notice a few things that they would want to change in how they're responding, but how much better to have that in sort of a very low stakes um, environment. And interview stream is a service that my university happens to subscribe to, but it could easily be mimicked in say pairs of students um, by having a set of job interview questions, which you as an instructor could furnish and then they could record one another and then you know practice some of those skills of critiquing presentation skills as well as um, some of the things you may have covered in your class about being a ideal job candidate so that was just one um, and for all of these examples we've given um, the tools or the supplies that that you as an instructor would need to make sure students had access to for each one and over on the right we've given some of the objectives and goals um, so that's interview stream another one is a photo essay i also teach um, some literature courses and one of the my favorite pieces that I cover, whether it's in a little class with, you know, 15 people or a great big one. I've taught lit surveys um, or co-taught them up to like 288 people. And so it's hard sometimes to, um, no matter what size your class is, it's hard to check if students are necessarily internalizing some of the bigger literary or cultural ideas that you're trying to cover. Um, in one of my classes, we talk about modernism and the wasteland by T.S. Eliot, which most people know is a great big monster and kind of not, not considered very approachable by many an undergraduate, especially if it's in like a gen ed course and they're not big lit people to begin with. Um, so in that course, for example, I've um, assigned a photo essay before, usually when they were in smaller courses where, um, Students would, we would talk in the wasteland about how T.S. Eliot kind of juxtaposes like really discordant images and how the shift between those images can kind of be as much part of the point as the images themselves. And so I asked students, what if you had to, to um, what if you had to tell the story of what it's like to be a college student your age, in your place, at this moment, um, but you couldn't use words to tell it, you just had to use a series of 10 photos and I, I described it as like an Instagram feed. Um, how, what would the, your 10 photos be? Maybe think about that, create that feed and then bring it back. And we talk about it together. Not just the images they select, which of course could be funny, quite poignant, serious, predictable, not predictable, but also um, how they choose to arrange those images, I think is, is vital and then you can also of course incorporate writing into many of these um, if you want to we can you could have students write sort of an analysis of the choices they made and why or you could just have them explain it maybe with a partner or to the class so that's just one a photo essay very low stakes most students have access to a smartphone or a digital camera um, another one that i thought had um, interesting potential for different kinds of learners um, and something that a certain subset of students would probably get pretty excited about is to create a video game um, based on objectives or ideas from something that you're studying. So this could work in like a history course, a philosophy course, certainly literature, art, all different things. Um, probably more humanities focused, but I'm sure it could be expanded. Um, and so some example websites are Buildbox and Flowlab. Both of them allow um, a student account to create one free um, video game. You can also see if your um, institution would be interested in like an educational package for that um, tool, if it's something that you'd like to use long-term. Um, but even without your university sort of buying into it, I think there's some good potential there. So um, when I've created this before, I've also um, offered it as a board game, like a actual crafting project. But I think the digital version is probably a little more inclusive and approachable because students could use a school computer um, if they don't have access to their own. And again, you could spend some class time really walking through, how does this work? How do you create objectives? How do you create um, you know, the gamification of your ideas there? So video games as one more option. 
Um, another one, and this one, Rachel and I, when we were talking about it, is really based on a, a course we took this last semester um, with our shout out to Dr. Conkel, um, who taught us in a digital humanities class um, about how you can use objects and like the creation of objects to think about text in a new way. And both of us experienced this this past semester and we both took a lot away from it. And so we wanted to add that as one of our options here um, as a digital tool. So a lot of universities have um, maker spaces or makeries um, or some access to maybe 3D printing. And if so, this is a great way to bring that into your courses. Um, so in this example, um, we would probably go through a, a basic user interface like Tinkercad or Google Sketch. And again, you would want to really walk through it slowly and carefully and make sure that you're not assuming levels of knowledge that you know, many a student, including us at the beginning of last semester, um, may not have. So it's good to take your time. It will take some class time, but um, it really forces you to think about an object from a text in a different way if you're having to recreate it, um, especially if that object is sort of a theoretical object to begin with. So obviously different instructors would apply this in different ways, but we wanted to offer it as something very different from a paper, but really that cut requires some pretty in-depth thinking on the topic. So our next slide is a Twitter diary. Um, this is of course another digital tool. Um, Twitter accounts are free and you can, um, a lot of professors have used Twitter um, to like do like live action kind of reenactments or performances even of different texts. But in this case, um, the example I put together for this would be just to take one character, maybe a historical figure that you've been working with or a fictional character, maybe in a piece of, you know, of a novel or something like that, and to create a Twitter account for that character and kind of walk through the action of whatever your text is from that person's perspective. Um, and it really would uh, encourage students, I think, to consider that character or that historical figure in a different way. And um, it would also be probably fun for many of them. And you could also bring those different accounts into dialogue, which could be good maybe out of class or even in class as well. Sorry, there we go. Um, another similar, and you may sense a theme here, um, way of evaluating or interacting with a text, analyzing it other than just sitting down writing a paper about it, would be to create a soundtrack or a playlist um, based on the text. And this is one where I do think writing um, analytically and speaking about why you make the choices you make, and again, like what your track order is, what the relationship of different tracks are to one another, what mood you are trying to create and why, um, there would probably be a writing component to this as well. But just the creation of the soundtrack um, or the playlist, um, you could use Spotify, even just YouTube, um, to put together sort of a musical landscape for your text, um, the way you could see it coming together. And I have assigned this before um, to do, it was with a unit we were happened to be doing um, on drama, and they had a lot of fun with it. And they were very interested, at least in that experience, a lot of students who I had not seen as engaged with, for example, 19th century American theater suddenly had like some opinions and some things to say. So I was happy with how that brought out different kinds of learners and seemed to make them comfortable in that classroom environment in a different way. Um, and then one more, so Wikipedia, right? Every, every scholars uh, sort of has lots of opinions and has heard lots of opinions about Wikipedia. But one way that I have used Wikipedia in class is to ask students to look for gaps or holes in Wikipedia's coverage of something that we have studied. Um, and sometimes I have given a lot of guidance on this. Sometimes I've left it more up to students depending on the situation. But I think that learning to edit and write for Wikipedia can be a really valuable skill for students. Um, for one thing, many of them use it frequently. Um, and we want the material there to be well researched and forcing them to sort of think through the biases and gaps and holes in Wikipedia's coverage is definitely a valuable thing for such a well-known and popular resource. Um, another thing that's good about teaching students to write for Wikipedia is that they have very, very specific formatting. And so it's not 
MLA or APA or any particular type of formatting. It's not a particular, um, you know, HTML or a particular code language. It's its own little set of rules for writing on Wikipedia. And so practicing that and sort of learning the grammar and the rules of this very small system, but a system that has a lot of influence is a really valuable thing. So um, in those Wikipedia assignments, there's a lot of different directions you can go with it. Um, certainly, we have some resources at the end of this presentation and we're very open to, of course, sharing those resources um, that talk about different directions you can go with some of these things. But I think that Wikipedia can be a valuable tool for bringing students into the conversation and helping them recognize places where different voices are and are not valued. We have a few more. Uh, we wanted to also talk about mapping. We think that allowing students to understand geographical space uh, can really be helpful, whether you're dealing there with, you know, anything in the history, historical event, or, you know, literature, figures, um, religion even. Uh, and there are uh, a lot of different tools, actually. Story maps is one, uh, history pin is another, and then of course, Google map. Uh, basically, anything that allows students to identify a specific place, but then also to understand additional things about that place. So I've used history pin, for example. It will allow you to uh, work with multimedia. So you can pin a location, you can also add pictures or videos, and then you can add uh, written analysis or explanation as well. So that's a really useful tool for helping students understand, you know, we did that for um, World War I. What were some of the major battles that took place in France and what were the after effects? So pictures from before and after um, as well were really helpful for them. Um, and, and I think when we live such digital lives, mapping is such an, a great way to allow students to engage with the world and see it for really what it is in the space and the distance uh, that's so integral, but I think can often get mushed up when we're talking digitally over you know, long distances. Uh, another tool which I love is a podcast. Uh, students essentially have to use a lot of the same skills um, as they would when they're composing a paper. Uh, because they need to, you know, be able to organize their ideas. They need to know their material. And in fact, the more that they know, the better they'll be able to talk about it. Um, but I assigned uh, podcasts this semester, for example, and some of the writers who were less strong really got an opportunity to shine with their podcast. The conversations that the students were having with each other because they did it in pairs was so impressive to me, the ways that they were demonstrating what they had learned um, without really even uh, on some level noticing. We had one where I was like, you know, you've got all of these really important things that you're saying, but you, you don't cite any sources. And, and she sort of looked at me and was like, you know, I never thought about that. It was just stuff that I had learned this semester. And so that, um, I think it really highlights student learning in a way uh, that maybe not other assessments are able to do. Uh, having that conversation, I think, is really important because we often learn through dialogue. Uh, and you can use all sorts of different tools for this. Um, I actually didn't even list the tools because it's, it's an e as easy as recording into your iPhone. And then you can, often your computer will come with software. The computer labs have software at your university. Um, we used Audacity, GarageBand, um, and there was one other one, I can't remember, uh, maybe SoundCloud, in order to do some sound editing for the podcast this semester. But students really worked with what they had, and they all produced pretty solid work there. Another thing that I like to use is timeline. And, and I tend to, so what I do for this is I make them do a timeline with something just to get used to the technology. Um, I've got a couple of different tools listed there that are free. Uh, my preference is actually uh, Night Labs timeline because it allows you to use, I believe it's that one, it allows you to use um, Google Sheets, is it, I think? Um, I don't know what they're called actually, but the Excel version of, on Google. And it's really, I think, easy to use once you figure it out. And so I make them do the assignment in class. I'll do, you know, do a timeline of this event. And then I will ask them to create a timeline as part of a bigger multimedia 
project that they'll do later. Uh, so students can work out the kinks a little bit there um, because before I had them do it in class as a small assignment, I had one student give me some pretty, um, pretty strident feedback about how long it took her to figure out the technology. And again, I realized, well, that isn't very welcoming or inclusive, so I can do better there. And I really like timelines as a function of a larger story. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk in a few minutes about you know, web publishing. And I, I think that this works really well in uh, assignments or uh, learning processes where they're working through publishing on the web in some way. Uh, textual analysis is another thing. Again, we're from English studies, so we do this. Um, but you can do this in different disciplines as well. I like Voyant. It has its own word cloud tool, but there are also free word cloud ones where that are pretty easy to use. Um, but the idea with textual analysis is that you can do a number of things that you wouldn't really be able to do if you were just reading like smaller texts at a time. So what I really like about Voyant, for example, is I can feed it a whole body of work. I can give it a lot of text and then I can look for patterns that occur across, you know, 10 of those texts. Things like term frequency, you know, where are things um, being highlighted and this sort of, it just allows us to do a lot. So um, what I will have students do is, this is again another in text or in class assignment that we'll do and then they might be able to build on it later if they choose uh, where they will feed, a, essentially create a corpus in the tool, and then use the options in the tool to do deeper investigations um, and to draw conclusions, you know, because that is a really valuable skill and a, an important part of critical thinking is drawing conclusions from sets of data. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, web publishing as a digital tool, it's inclusive. It, it invites students to participate in broader conversations. And there are really a number of ways that you can do this. Um, you can have students create blogs, which are video logs, if you didn't know that, um, upload them to YouTube. There are also different tools like Flipgrid that you can use in order to do that. Those are, they'll create like smaller versions of videos. Um, and students will have a lot of fun with this, um, but there's often a lot of thought that goes into uh, they're not just filming themselves without any preparation. They need to prepare, they need to compose. Often they're in conversation with friends about how to do this. Um, blogs is a good one. This is often students will have to create a website first and then post regular updates, interacting with um, a text or something else that I want them to be thinking through. And you can ask students to comment on each other's blogs. You can ask students to, hey, share your blog on social media um, and invite them into a broader cultural conversation. Websites are a good way to do this. Um, you might also have students publishing in a slightly more, I guess, formal form with an online exhibit where maybe they're not just dissecting things or analyzing things, but they are showing artifacts and they are going to you know, give you the information about that artifact and maybe make it interactive if they can. Uh, these variety of publishing platforms really allow students to create something that they can be proud of, right? And that they are not just creating for you. Um, maybe the link does go dead after your class is over, but um, oftentimes students have come back to me and said, you know, I, you know, I still use that website that I made or I showed this to so and so and they were really impressed and um, it's something that we can um, encourage students to use in their digital portfolios, um, publish to their own websites, that sort of thing uh, as a way of presenting themselves to the world. Uh, and then uh, just in terms of concluding, we've got some last thoughts. Again, this is a way, digital tools are a way for us to think beyond just papers. Um, another thing that we wanted to make sure to sort of end with or discuss with all of you is that we want to make sure that you are really spending time and that we are really spending time walking students through and taking time to explore the interface for these tools early on. Um, I think it's really important that we model discovery, like it says, that we aren't afraid to 
you know, pop up a new tool up on the overhead, explore it, model what it's like to get used to a new piece of software or a new unfamiliar interface. You know, that can be really valuable sometimes for students to see that that's part of learning for us as well. Um, not to be afraid to try new things. Certainly in maybe a lower stakes environment, we know that we just threw like 20 things at you, but maybe one or two of these things could enter a different type of class either as an in-class activity or something to do over the weekend as homework rather than like a major assessment tool if you're feeling like um, that that nervousness or uncertainty. So model that, talk about it. Don't be afraid to tell students like that you're exploring it. Don't be afraid to spend class time exploring it beside them. And we also think that whenever you're in doubt, you should involve students in decision making. I think this has been a really helpful approach for me as I'm using new tools. Um, for example, podcasting this semester, that was the first time I'd done that. And part of that was because um, I needed to figure out the technology first and I needed to be able, be assured that I could lead them. Um, but we sat down and we said, okay, what do we want in our podcast? What are we looking for as a class? What are some you know, decisions that we wanna make so we targeted time, uh, how much time, what would be the minimum for each podcast. And then we, we, they did them, they recorded the podcast and we started listening to them and we sat down and we we're like, these are too long. <laughs> They're getting a little draggy. So we revised the time and allowing students some of that um, agency in their own work and their own choice uh, can really help them to own what they're producing and uh, feel like they have mastery over the material. And then finally, as with any change, um, we wanted to emphasize that imperfection is better than inaction. Whenever we're talking about inviting voices to the table and trying to improve our teaching to be more inclusive, more welcoming, it sometimes can be, um, it can sometimes cause a little bit of nervousness on the, on the part of instructors. Why change it if what you're doing works, right? Why mess with this paper assignment that you've successfully deployed many, many times? Or um, why change an assessment that, um, like papers generally, that has been successful for a long time? Um, we're just trying to encourage people to try something, right? Mix it up a little bit. Don't worry that you aren't, you know, perfectly executing every goal of perfect inclusive teaching. Be willing to be vulnerable, make mistakes, talk about those mistakes, and include students in sort of the ongoing process. But we wanted to encourage you to don't let sort of the perfect be the enemy of the good, as the, as the saying goes, and be willing to embrace some kind of change, take some kind of action and steps toward what we hope will make a better experience for you and for your students. And that is all we have for you. So we welcome your questions. We have a chat window that is devoid of questions at the moment. So <laughs> maybe we've explained things uh, so thoroughly, but we did want to invite anyone who had something they'd like to ask or even have us expand on to jump in and let us know. Uh, so Noah asked how long uh, we use for the podcast progress. Do you mean for like creating the podcast or, you know, like 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes of the podcast? The whole unit. Okay. So I started from scratch. I did a day where students brought their laptops and they recorded like one to two minutes of themselves into their phone and then transferred it to their laptops. And the goal was that by the end of the class, they would have that attached to like a theme music. And so that would be it. And that took us the whole period. We didn't accomplish that. Um, so we started from very, very scratch in the middle of March. And they, we finished the podcast, I think it was April 19th it was. So I took about five to six weeks for that. And it wasn't the only thing we were doing, but we did do some workshopping of that along the way. Uh, a, oh, a student project that used a timeline. Yes, I taught a class on um, stories of conflict. And so we studied a text called, um, it's by Philip Gorovich, I believe. Um, and 
it's called, I don't know, it's about the Rwandan genocide. I forget what it's called. It's a long title. And so students did a project where they published something to medium.com and it included a timeline of the events just to demonstrate how quickly um, the genocide took place. It, it was a really a matter of months for them. And so they were plotting key events in that as they discussed uh, their argument. We have another question um, about grading these and whether we provide a rubric to students in advance. Also any pushback because papers are so trusted as an assessment tool. Um, I can answer part of that, uh, which is that I always do provide a rubric to students in advance. Um, I through my learning management system, we use Canvas. And um, if I am able to put the rubric up before um, posting the assignment, then students are able to view it through Canvas. But I could also, there are other ways, of course, just handing it to them would also work. Um, but I do try to leave a little wiggle room the first time that I'm assigning something. And I'll usually put a statement on the rubric about how maybe the weighted values might be subject to change or um, how I might expand upon some of the criteria within it. I try to be upfront about the fact that it's my first time doing it, but still confident enough that it doesn't flounder or seem like I'm, you know, just flying by the seat of my pants the whole time. So there's some balance there. Um, in terms of pushback, personally, um, I haven't um, experienced too much pushback because I've tried to um, always frame the work with objectives that sound quite similar to the objectives of a written piece of, you know, an, an analytical paper or something like that. I've tried to make sure that my objectives line up closely with the objectives and learning outcomes that we're looking for. And you can also sort of tweak that a little bit. Uh, like students will write differently when they're writing for a blog, but mm -hmm. often if you're looking for ideas or if you're looking for analysis that performs the same function as an academic paper so you can you know use more inclusive digital tools um, and sort of I guess shake things up for the student a little bit uh, but still have the same sort of outcomes and I like Julie do have rubrics I've used I've called students in where they're doing like individual projects that they're proposing and based on their proposal we'll give them a rubric but it's really important that you do come up with something ahead of time because you want to make sure that they're putting in the time and effort on the things that you're valuing. Uh, you don't want them to just slap a bunch of pictures in there, right? You want them to think about what pictures they're including in a story that's being published to Medium. So those are important things that you want to make sure the students know up front. Definitely. I've also used rubrics a lot in terms of transparency and it's um, always, I don't know if it's surprising or shocking, but it's something when I realize sometimes how how forcing things onto a rubric even allows me to think through what am I actually asking them to do? I have a sort of a picture in my mind of, oh, that's how this will look. But when you force yourself as an instructor to, to put those ideas down and attach point values to them even, it really helps you think about what your priorities are for your, for your students and their learning. Ooh, are there any FERPA issues with asking students that's a good question. I haven't run into any that I'm aware of. Um, I think the FERPA issues would be for grading, right? And, and they're, because students can have the option, like if they're doing a blog, they can make that blog private and only give the link to me. Um, but it's their grade and sharing their grades that would be the FERPA issue, right? I'm trying to think. I'm not sure that might be something to look into. The can you explain a little bit more what you're asking about the Oh. I know in the past when we've done for example WordPress I've um in terms of you know creating a blog and putting some content up there, I've emphasized to them that um, they didn't have to use their name or the university information in it. It could be you know Butterfly Forty Five's blog about whatever, as long as I personally had the link that would line up. You know who was whom. Um, so I didn't um, I didn't ask that they put 
their personal name on it because I know sometimes you know your digital legacy matters to students especially maybe from outside majors um, so we tried to address that although it, it did turn out that most students chose to use at least their first names involved in the process yeah that's a good, a good question probably one I can be a little bit better about too That makes sense. I think you would need to be aware of what your institution's requirements are. Um, and some institutions actually do have like in-house WordPress, for example. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be a public record if you're using the in-house uh, version. Uh, so that would be something you would need to know um, probably based on your, your own university. That's not something that our university um, has really made a big deal out of so far. My university, I should say. Also, I think students um, do write differently when they know that something is visible outside of class. So if it's possible within the constraints of your university and the understanding of FERPA, like just having people, whether it's Wikipedia or creating, you know, public web content, like having people, it, it gives a sense of responsibility and ownership for their work when they know that it could um, be part of a broader conversation than just, oh, my instructor's going to grade this and then that'll be the end. Any other questions? Those are some good ones, thank you. All right, I think we are done. Thank you all very much for coming to our webinar and really appreciate your participation. And thank you, Rachel. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Adeshima, for allowing us to, to do this. We really appreciate the opportunity. All right, bye everyone. Bye, thank you. Hi, Megan.